three. Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Community Conversations with Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine. I am your host. I guess I call myself a host, Tamika Isaac Devine, and I'm excited to have you guys here um, tonight for this uh, conversation. Um, I am honored tonight to have uh, with us a dynamic uh, young lady um, who is an expert when it comes to minority businesses. And I shared this on my live a little bit earlier to you guys. And for those who might not have seen it, um, you know, lately there's been a lot of conversation about racial justice issues, criminal justice issues, social justice issues, and all of those have been amazing conversations. The one thing, though, I think um, has not gotten as much attention as I think it deserves is as we're talking about what needs to happen and the changes that we like to see, the changes we need to advocate for, right up there at the top of the list needs to be um, equal access to economic opportunities. And we know that we do that through uh, supporting minority businesses, making sure that minority businesses have equal access to uh, business, whether it be co government contracts, it being corporate contracts. And traditionally, just because of his systemic racism, we have not had the access to those opportunities as majority businesses are. And so as we continue to talk about um, the, the changes that we want to see and the things that we want to do, I want to press upon us to, to educate ourselves about where the real um, power is, um, if I could use the word power, and we look at economic um, opportunities and how do we make sure that we not only have a seat at the table, but that we are able to make our own table and that we're able to make our own deals. And so um, as I was thinking about this issue and uh, wanting to educate ourselves about this. And also, as you guys know, those of you who have been joining me every week for Community Conversations, um, you know, I also like us to be empowered to leave uh, this conversation with some action items. I was just hoping that we can get to the point where people leave here with great information, but also have action items that they want to uh, do and, and support as we move forward. So I couldn't think of anybody else I would rather interview than uh, Diane Sumter, who is the president and CEO of Dietza Inc. Um, and she's also the operator of the uh, Minority Business Development Agency. So um, just a little bit about Diane. I've um, dating, I guess, myself and her. I've known Diane uh, for many, many years as Miss Sumter. Um, her daughter, who is also um, a, a wonderful entrepreneur here in the Columbia community, uh, Dion and I went to uh, from fifth grade on up together. And so I, I always knew of Miss Sumter as a business leader. Didn't really know and understand back then what she did. Um, but as I became more involved at grow as I got older and started working in the community and got more involved, certainly in politics, I. Um, quickly learned who Diane Sumter is. Um, like I mentioned, she is the president and CEO of Dietza Inc., um, where she oversees um, and manages um, profitability within all divisions of the business. Um, they do minority business development. She also does a lot of contracts, particularly government contracts, which we'll talk about. Um, but she also is um, and a trainer and educator. She's certified in economic development and she works a lot with businesses on how to not only for them to establish and grow, but to be profitable. Um, she also serves on the Midlands Technical College um, board and the um, and is part of South Carolina Future Minds. In addition to that, uh, she has been the operator of the Minority Business Development Agency Business Center for more than 20 years. And so I get a lot of people who say, hey, I want to start a business. How do I do this? And um, if you come to me about that, I've recommended that you guys contact MBDA because they help with those type things. So um, with that introduction, Diane, welcome and thank you so much because I know you are a super busy woman and I thank you so much for taking time to be here. Well, thank you very much, Councilwoman Devine. I consider it an honor when I get to t share with anyone something that I believe in, I live, and very passionate about. Something I also think that we need to leave to the next generation 
and the next generation. Everything at this point in time in our lives should be about economic power. Exactly. And that is so important because we can, we can, and you know, and you and I to talk about voting all the time, we can vote and we got to vote. We got to make sure we vote because we got to have the right people in there. But, you know, being out there marching, all that is part of the puzzle. But ultimately, we want to make sure that we have economic power. And um, last week, I interviewed um, Brandon Upson, who is with Amplify Action. And one of the things that he talks about is amplifying uh, your vote, amplifying uh, your voice, and amplifying your power. And he talks about economic power. So this is great to have you on here. Um, Barbara Ballard Belton says hello. She has signed on. Thank you, Barbara, for listening. Make sure that you share this broadcast and and tag and invite people that you know um, want to hear this conversation because this is definitely a conversation any business owner needs to hear. Um, so Diane, I gave a brief um bio of you but um like i said you know at, you know growing up with with dion and and um and everything i knew you were a business i knew you were an entrepreneur i really didn't know what you did um and i know um you know you have been a business owner for many many years but can you start off with telling us a little bit about like what actually got you um interested in minority business development and 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 where did that passion really start with you you know, interestingly enough, my late father always asked me, well, what do you do? Why can't you teach? And I would tell him, I'm teaching all of the time. But I was teaching about something other than in the classroom. And when you look at it, I started many moons ago. I well remember when we had the riot in Los Angeles. I remember very clearly the burning down of that area moving from there to Miami and burning down of that area. And it always dawned on me, why are we burning our own? Why can't we build up our own? And then I began to move and get further in it. My first contract, really, I was working for Moses Clarkson, who was certainly a dynamic leader. And we bid a contract that I thought was to teach. I read it saw what it needed. I said, I can do this. Little did I know it would put me on a pathway of really what sometimes I hear changing lives. The change and the growth for me was always, and I would tell the businesses, I learned this last night, that I study, study, study. And you'll have to do that. We're at a time when we have to even study more. But as I was studying and growing, I learned very early that we had to keep moving. When I started at one thing, and after a while I saw where it was going, it was time to move again because there was always someone new coming in the same space. And that's perfectly okay. When they come in that space, I should be able to move to the next space. And so continuously moving. The other thing that was extremely important for me was the finances. I learned very early that you need to, your word needs to be your bond and you needed to manage your money so that you could get access to credit. So there was just some basic principles that I started with and live by today. But I also knew we had to teach, teach, teach. And there would always be a new person out there. And it was our responsibility if that person was serious to help that person grow. And that's what we try and do every day at the Minority Business Development Center. Now, that's only one part of Dietz's work. We also work with formerly incarcerated, but we're working with them because they are really some excellent entrepreneurs. We're just trying to have them be ex-entrepreneurs in the mainstream main. But we've been so fortunate also to be in engineering. And that was really, we had people through the City of Columbia Mentor Protege Program show us how to get a certificate of authority. And today, that's probably one of our largest components of our business. So as again, I say, study, study, study. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. You know, I remember once when my lights got turned off because I didn't have any money. I was on my office on Bull Street. And one of my mentors, I was just crying down. He says, are you going to cry? Are you going to come here and borrow this money? 
I told him, I'm going to cry all night, and in the morning, I'll be there to get the money and turn the lights back on. So you have to know you're going forward, you're coming backwards. You're going forward, you're coming backwards. You just keep getting up, getting up, and getting up. Plus, if it's for you, you're going to get it. You just have to be willing to do what you want, need to do to invest in it. And anytime someone gives you an opportunity, you need to do everything within your power to make certain that you deliver on that opportunity. Yeah, that's exactly. So, I mean, if, as someone who has been in this in this field for such a long time, um, what what changes have you seen? I mean, you've been working hard. You've, as, as people would say, you've been in the vineyard. I remember when I first got elected. Um, you, as a member, um, with you have many hats, but you, as a member of the NAACP, I remember would bring in city officials every year to talk about what we had done as far as minority um, contracts, the money we were spending, et cetera. Um, and I know that, you know, that that was that was just part of the, the things that you were doing to hold um, our government officials accountable. But tell us what changes have you seen over the years in your working with um, my minority business development? You know, I'll take the positive changes. I remember Senator Patterson going in front of Richland District 1 and letting them know that this too is a business. Your business is education, but you have a responsibility to those parents. And Vince Ford, Leon Howard, and those heard him. And because they heard him, they put programs into place that I can tell you, Dr. Lynn, CDI, and DITSA benefited significantly for the programs they put in place. And I was always awed that they changed no laws. They, they followed the Atlanta mayor and said, if you come in front of me, bring someone who looked like me from this community. And people readily did it. Those businesses didn't fight, didn't squabble. They immediately partnered with us, brought us to the table, and many of us began to grow and grow from that. And I see at the Richland District 1, some of the same things that they started during that time is still in place. And that was such a blessing. And it really strengthened us. And we knew if the right people are in place, things will change and things can get done. Moving on from there, I remember during the time when we had um, E.W. Cromartie and Bob Coble and those on city council, they decided to do the disparity study. During the disparity study, it was clearly shown that the city of Columbia largest dollar or one of its dollars was in water and sewer, but they had no water and sewer. They did not have a large number. Frankly, they had Jimmy Chow working out there sometimes by himself and doing such a wonderful job that he became a teacher to many of us after then, but they, when I became a protege, my mentor, which was um, a, well, it's a calm now, but um, had a River Smith at that time. No, I forget the name, but they decided and showed me how to become an engineering firm. And today we have a certificate of authority, but you've got to be willing to put yourself out there. And if you have the people in places and spaces who are willing to help you. So when I look at Richland One, I look at the city of Columbia, I can actually see that they were serious about certain things and it moved us to the next level and continue to do so. You still see the Richland District One, City of Columbia being the leader when it comes to assisting and, and growing and developing minority business. But you know, you find that minority business is good business because we do several things. Minority businesses, have a higher rate of African-Americans that we hire. Minority businesses pay taxes, and we're never given credit for that. In addition to that, we serve on boards and give our time and our talent. So, and it's good for a community to see that there's opportunities in that community. So one of the things the minority businesses in this city and state try to do to be of such that folks see, hey, that's an opportunity. Not only can I get a job, I can create a job. And so with that in mind, it continues to grow this environment. 
you know, it's no question we're in pr- unprecedented times. This pandemic has been an eye open that we could never even imagine, but it has peeled back such huge things and showed us things that we needed to do different. And I promise you, it has moved the technology arena five years from now. We will never go back to where we were. We have to be changing. And so that's a lesson I think for all of us, for the city to step to the plate, for the state, for the businesses to step to the plate. I'm reminded very recently, we have something many areas don't have. We have a minority owned bank on Main Street that's trying to create wealth and building up our distressed areas. Now we are fortunate to have that, but what is our role in it? We have to participate with that bank. And so I wrote something one Sunday morning, grandmamas building up grandchildren by starting an account at our bank. But you know, I'm also reminded that in North Carolina, they have a Native American bank, Lumbee Bank. So I've been working with that area also. And I'm just honored to be working with our bank here and would like to have more people join me in that effort because we can have a strong base. I looked at their loans and I I read many articles and see they invest back in the community, in our distressed communities. So I'm just privileged to have come across so many different businesses. I recently ran across a hemp business and working with that business, He's on the farm that his grandmother was a slave. I said, what a privilege from a slave to a business owner. Now, to me, that's just oying, et cetera. And we've got many stories around here of businesses who picked up, you know, I think of Dr. Lynn all the time. He's probably one of the most giving people. Any time I call Dr. Lynn, Nate Spells, Jimmy Chow, I need so-and-so for so-and-so, they come to the plate so that we do have a base of businesses that's willing to share. And what do we need to do now? We need to strengthen that base and strengthen those behind us. But we, we have to step up and be quality businesses. We can't be playing around like we're just having fun. I tell people all the time, Jimmy Two Shoes and Michael Corbag not going to get it. And I love (laughs) Jimmy Two Shoes. What I need them to do is to invest in their business, pay their debt, and study, 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 and hire quality people. That is so good. You hit on so many things I want to follow up on. I will say Kristen Johnson is watching. I know she is a... um, a, a real estate developer, and she said, "Yep, I'm on it." When you said about my um by um Optus Bank, so I'm thinking she means that yes, she's on it. To open up account, Kristen. Make sure you do that and you share that information as well. Um, but it was a couple things you t- you touched on, Diane. I'm gonna I'm go over one one um, and you mentioned uh, Mayor Jackson. So um, just recently, I rewatched the documentary on Mayor Jackson. Um, you know, as particularly as an elected official, as an African American elected official, um, you know, Mayor Jackson w- was the pinnacle of you know elected officials that did exactly what you talked about. Is didn't worry about changing laws or anything, but work within what was currently in his authority to make sure that people who wanted to do business with the city uh, city of Atlanta um, look like um, look like the city of Atlanta, look like the citizens. And so um, he made sure that there were there were programs and, you know, a lot of folks look at the the Hartsville Jackson Airport as, you know, a major project. You know, just what a couple years ago when they did the new Falcon Stadium, there was significant minority uh, participation in the, the development of that stadium. And so Atlanta really is a model for a lot of us um, as city leaders at, at what they do. Um but, you know, one of the things that I, I think about uh, when I think about uh, what uh, Mayor Jackson did and and kind of where we are now, you know, 20, 30 years later, um, and I think this is kind of like with everything, like we talk about how as, as you know, African-Americans, quote, arrived and we moved out and into the suburbs and things and, and kind of forgot some of the struggle. Um, how do you see uh, what... 
Mayor Jackson did in the area as it relates to opening up opportunities um, back then? And what exactly do you see like now? Do you feel like we've progressed more? Do you think it's the same? Do you think we re regress? What are you seeing? You know, from the standpoint of education and from the group behind me, we have some of the smartest potential entrepreneurs ever. We have invested in education and our children can go so much further. What I find though, is that the environment has to be created so that they stay here instead of moving elsewhere. And to do that, we have to have opportunities here. When you look at what Maynard did, when I sit back and think about it, changing no laws. One of the first disparity studies, probably done two or three since then, he clearly, it was a, a commitment. It was a will. It was a vision. And he bought, he had others who came to Atlanta to buy into it. And because they bought into it, and it wasn't just in certain things, it was for media. It was for attorneys. It was for grocery stores. It was for every aspect of business. For too long here, we might have focused on one thing or two things. But when I look at it now, it's across the spectrum that we need. You know, when you look at our, we never considered our barbershops, hair salons, nail spa until they weren't here. And we saw that they were a vital part of the business community. They, and that we needed to keep them propped up also. But see, the community people, those, the money flow from each of us to them. And that's one of the things that we've got to work on harder. How do we keep our dollar flowing among us all the time? I make certain that within DITSA, I try, whether it's my janitorial, whether as many of the businesses that I can use, I make certain that they are minority owned businesses because we do need to flow that dollar, flow that dollar. I looked and saw one of our um, media and saw that they needed some help. So I called them and I said, I will run an article and pay for it once a month because we need, we need that voice that comes from them. So what I guess I'd like to see, and I saw it with Maynard, because I too was in Atlanta for about five years with my business with an office there. And that was only because he'd opened up such opportunities there. And we can do that same thing here. We just have to think about it. When I look at the businesses, sometimes I get a little troubled because I don't see the will that we saw. You know, when I started and when I, Nate Spell started in his garage, Dr. Lynn started with his wife doing the business. When I started and all, we were ready to kick the door in. And believe it or not, that same tenacity has to be there now for the next generation. It's not going to open easy for you. You've got to go through it. And when you get through it, leave it open enough so somebody else can come through it also. Pull, reach back and get someone else. Make certain that we do business with each other so that that dollar flows. You know, I'm told that for some nationalities, it flows seven times among them. For us, it's two or three and maybe one. So we need to think a little harder about how we use the little funds that we have to build up the businesses that we have. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. So another thought when you were talking that, that kind of came up, you know, after after George Floyd and after after people started talking about, you know, this racial reckoning that our country is going through and and, and being a part of the change, uh, you had all these major companies coming out with statements, um, which were all fine and good. But, you know, what I and, and lots of folks were saying, a statement is one thing. Now let's see what action you're going to put, you know, put behind it. You know, are you going to be putting, you know, people of color on your boards? Are you going to make sure that there are opportunities for, you know, minority businesses to get opportunities with you? Um, I was really pleased today that I saw um, 
our, our friend and, and sister Mignon Clavern um, is now um, going to be on the board of Lionsgate, which is huge. And I'm so, so excited for her. And so hopefully more major corporations like Lionsgate will do that and find some really wonderful qualified um, African Americans and and not just take our money, but make sure that we are we're at the table. But with that said, um, you know, I just can't help but to to go back to thinking, are you know, this is a time, are we really using this time and and making sure that we are putting our best foot forward, but not just that, positioning ourselves to take advantage. And then, you know, like you said, kick down some of those doors of opportunity that have been closed to us. I do think there's still a lot more opportunities with governments. Um, the city, we need to do better. The county, um, I know uh, Commissioner Aaron Bishop at Richland One said he wants to elevate the the minority participation that they have there. Um, but, you know, these are all uh, predominantly minority um, councils. So I, I just would love to hear your thoughts on Number one, opening up opportunities in other areas of government where you might not have as many people who look like us on those elected bodies. You know, the responsibility that those non, you know, African-American elected officials have to, to open up those opportunities. And then also about the corporations, you know, where are those opportunities and how do we make sure that those doors are open to us as well? You know, I certainly give a shout out to Mignon Clyburn, while she was on that commission, she often talked about and pushed the need for internet, for internet in all of these distressed and rural areas. Sometimes the voice wasn't heard, but the pandemic came and everybody knows that in our rural area, we need to strengthen the, um, the internet. So she paved the way in that with her voice and she certainly um, has served us well. So I do say congratulations, and I know she'll do a good job. But you know what? We got a lot of Mignons, so we need these other organizations to step up and do the same kind of thing. Um, I was just reading something this afternoon talking about Santee Cooper and how it was no minority on that board. I'm always looking at how does the board structure look? But when the door opened in the board structure, you know, I look at Dr. Lynn, he served us on Clemson very well. He has done more scholarships. He's reached out, frankly, my grandson is there and he, Dr. Lynn declares it's all because of him. But um, <laughs> I'll take a little credit for that. But he really had much to do with it and it served us well. When we get on these boards, we need to realize it's not just to sit there is not just to be present and is not to act up. We need to serve the people who we represent and who we are supposed to be looking out for. We need to change these distressed communities. When I look back over our housing situation, it saddens me when I began to see when we're moving from affordable housing to make it why it's so difficult for people to pay their mortgage and their rent. So we need to revisit some of those things. But at the same time, when I look at corporations, they are stepping up and I'm expecting them to step up so much. I'd like to call on Google. I'd like to call on Dominion. I'd like to call on Acom. All of them can do one thing. They can invest in our bank. You know, and if they invest in our bank, I'm comfortable that the bank then will invest into the distressed communities. I'm comfortable that the, the bank will then put funds out there that um, minority business will have access. And when we begin to talk about the stack of capital, it has to be so much more than debt. We need to think about equity capital. You know, the PPP was probably the first time we were able to get funds because we had our house somewhat in order. But when you look at it, the PPP was designed for those who were a Schedule C or a Schedule S and did 941s. When it got to the those who were 1099s, single member LLC, K1, and if they weren't profitable, they did not know they needed to change theirs to revenue. 
Now, I have been pushing, pushing, pushing for that. And even now, I'm going to have a meeting with the regional director of SBA, because in my mind, that group is still owed some of the PPP. And I know it ends August 8th, but until then, it's still out there. And so that's one kind of funding. But we need to think about equity capital, and we need to think about changing the structure of business. Where is the manufacturing companies? Where are the IT companies? Who's exporting and importing? All of our firms don't need to be service firms. When I think about Perrin Mitchell, and he started Article 21, which is the highway bill that DOT follows, or maybe it's the highway bill. <laughs> the piece that was not in it was capital. And because there was no capital in it, it ended up being that those minority businesses, regardless of how hard they work, stayed at the bottom of the food chain. So what I'm hoping now through, whether it's the EDA, whether it's the CARES Act, that we can come up and get equipment because we didn't come to be subs. Some of us can be prime contractors. Some of us can be the leader of the pack and have the larger company as our subs. So what I'm hoping that with this pandemic, we'll change the trajectory and we began to see a group move out there as leaders of the pack with the other businesses be, being our subs or mentor protege has its benefit, but we need a mentor who understand what is a mentor protege. I can tell you for Bill Davis, we would not be an engineering firm today that Bill Davis showed me the pathway, didn't know it, didn't understand it. But once he showed it to me, it became so clear and today, that's why we are in that industry. So that has merit. We just need more Bill Davises. We need more companies to step up to the plate. I'm beginning to see quite a few stepping up. I'm hoping that Santee Cooper step up. I'm hoping that just all of them up there need to step up. And stepping up, we aren't asking for a handout. We aren't asking for you to give us anything. We will earn the business and do you a quality job. We're only asking for an opportunity. Mm -hmm. That is so true. Cause I mean, even for, for me, you know, um, you know, I, I do bond work um, kind of under, it's not official men or protege, but you know, I have a majority firm that has been doing it. And most people don't recognize that bond work is an area of law that was closed for many, many years to minority uh, businesses, minority attorneys. Um, it's very costly to learn. It's, uh, it's, it's very um, intricate, um, but we are very qualified to do it. If you, if you have somebody who has been in it and teaches you. And when I partnered with Parker Poe over 10 years ago to start doing bond work, um, not only did, you know, we do it for, you know, Richland one and, Richland County, who, you know, wanted minority partners, but, you know, the, the mentor, Parker Poe, actually said, okay, Tamika, let's go to other areas that didn't require a minority partner, but they were committed to helping me um, grow my business in that way. So you're so right. And and that's where the, the folks who say we're about social justice, we're about racial justice, what can we do? And there's all these non-minority groups or, my, well, white business owners, people who say we want to be allies. And I have people say, well, what does that really mean? As a business owner, as an ally, that's the thing that you can do as well is don't wait for somebody to say, do you work? Do you support other minority businesses? Do you, you know, do you partner with minority businesses? Those are things that you can do and show that you're committed to the cause. So that I think your your points are really well taken. And you think of a black female engineer, you know, you're, there's not many who are in that space. And you've been able to work in the city of Columbia and other places uh, because the door was open. And then once you walked through the door, you showed up and you showed that you could do the work. You know, I want to give a shout out to Parker Poe for taking you, and you said something very clear, to other places didn't require it. What I would like to give a challenge to for all of the other bond attorneys to stand up, show up, and show out. And it does not have to be because it's required. One, it's the right thing to do, and you do your part of the work. And you know what? 
it allows them to go get more work. So I'm really mm -hmm. encouraged by what we planned on seeing in the future in the bond area. I so well remember it when we started at Richland District 1 with it because we happen to have the contract to help them develop all of these areas, et cetera. And that was just one we were just so proud of. But that's why I'm saying, let's look at other fields now. Who are our IT contractors? Who's out there manufacturing? Who's in energy? Um, Dominion, who are you actually using that you can develop into something else? Santee Cooper, who are you using? Duke, all of them can begin to look at who's partnering with them that will do them a good job and it began to create an economic wealth in an area that you don't usually see. I'm also in calling out to the minority businesses, it's time to step up. Let's do not only do what we see the others do. Think of new markets. We've got Joe James out here. He's growing a crop that will allow him to clean the soil. And it's, he's doing it in Baltimore. He's doing it in other places. So I can't wait till we start seeing the value of that in South Carolina and all. We need to think, what are the other businesses that we can do versus, because what I tell people all the time, the business that I've been so fortunate to grow in and develop will not be the business five years from now. It needs to have a different twist. I think my staff is so tired of me telling them that they've got to change their skill set. They've got to step to the plate. Everything is going to be digital. It's going to be in a whole nother environment. So we got to prepare ourselves to work in that environment. <laughs> you are so right. So um, let me ask you, um, uh, and then I want you to talk about some of the seminars that you have coming up, because I think we definitely have some small businesses that have some needs. Um, but before we go to there, let me ask you about, as, as someone who has been, you know, working particularly in opening up opportunities for black businesses. And you talked about, as we open, you said economic power. You know, we do know that small businesses is the best way for someone to build generational wealth. Um, and, and looking at you, that's what you, you've done. I mean, you've built a business. You know, your daughter, Dion, has, you know, has built a business. And then now your grandson is working for you. And, you know, and, and so that that's what we talk about when we talk about generational wealth. Um, and I don't know if everybody looks at it that way when they're, you know, it's just like, oh, I have a passion for barbering or I have a passion for, um, you know, uh, having a, a cleaning service or a, a T-shirt printing service. But that is a business. And so uh, as you look at kind of where we've been and then where we are now, um, what would you as we're building that next generation of businesses, what are the opportunities that you think that we need to be continually looking for and fighting for? Because we, what we also know is that even in this time, as, as positive as it sound, seems right now with everybody wanting to be ally and, 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 and showing that they, they care about racial justice, not everybody cares about racial justice, especially when it comes to their money. So there's still going to be be uh, op it's still going to be incumbent upon us to knock down and kick down some of those doors. So what are some of the opportunities you think that we, number one, need to be looking for and taking advantage of, but then the opportunities that we need to be demanding and kicking in doors to try and uh, open up for us? You know, when I think of opportunities now, I absolutely believe that we are going to have to increase our skill set. And that's from Dita and every other company out there that we no longer can do what we did before the pandemic. Now, what does increase your skill set mean? We need to almost turn the um, turn the wheel for the kind of skill for the jobs that's going to be there. If you really look at what the pandemic has done, those jobs that was laborers, those jobs that was um, people could start in, they're not going to be there. Amazon and some of the others already have their robot. If you recall, five years ago or so, the fast food came out with their robot and it didn't go well, so they put the robot back in the shelf. But the robot is out to stay now. If you go to the grocery store, you're scanning. Every time I would go to the airport, I see them scanning. So what does that tell me? It tells me that we need to be in an IT environment 
where we can fix and program that machine. It tells me that we need to go back, step back and look, where is our math? What is our school sets doing to prepare? It also tells me when we look at the trades, we need our young to know it's nothing wrong with you fixing that car, but why don't you prepare to own that body shop and then you move on and maybe own you a car lot. So I think it has to change so we can see doing what is the least of the work is nothing but a pathway to doing most of the work. And at one day you will own that work and others will be doing it. But it's good to know it yourself when you go out to have others doing it. So I guess I see IT is going to be in everything. You know, you're hearing about solar this and solar clean, clean energy. What does that mean? Somebody's in that ocean being an oceanographer. Somebody's on top of that roof capturing the sun. We've got to begin to talk, work with our youth and our children so that they see there is a world out there of new businesses, of new opportunities, and how are we getting them? We need to, unfortunately, to change our school system, to change the teacher's thinking, to change the board's thinking, all of us need to be thinking, how are we preparing the next generation for tomorrow? And it can't be prepared in the same way we were prepared. And that's hard work. You know, I'm a McKenzie lover. Everybody knows I send them more reading than they can ever do. McKenzie <laughs> speaks more on these things than anybody. Um, I just enjoy seeing they have a, a chart out on the rebound. And it tells me for some industries, it's going to take five years to rebound. If you're a minority-owned business, you don't have that time because you don't have that capital. And if you don't have that capital, you can't keep your staff. So we need a quicker turnaround. And that's why all of this discussion in Washington and all is so critical now because we, we will either live now or we'll go under. But for some of us, we have to commit that we're going to hold on we're going to do what we need to do, and we're going to be each other's bridge so that we each can help each other. I try every day to work with some business, whether I like them or not. <laughs> if they call me, I try and serve them because that's what I've been called to do. You know, I was talking with Sandy Jackson today, and she said something very powerful. She says, we no longer have at the schools what we had when they were teaching them brick mason but maybe it needs to be called something else because maybe it can be called something that they can not only see the hard work of Brick Mason, but they can also see that they can lay that street out, that they can move on to owning the Brick Mason place, that they can own that concrete, that they then can take all of that and become a business owner. Now, everybody isn't cut out to be a business owner because you truly, I tell folks, you have to be willing to give it all up to get anything. And the first one who come off of my payroll is me when we don't have any money. And sometimes we don't have money, but that's okay. <laughs> because we're going to have money next week or the week after. And you've got to be willing to commit. And people are willing to help you. And that's why I think the mentors are so um, wonderful. They're really willing to help you when they see you're willing to help yourself. Um, we have several mentors now that's been phenomenal. You know, I called um, Bill Orr at Hayes and Sawyer, and he, we don't even have a project yet. I just told him, I need work for one of my employees so that he provided me. He said, I need some help over here. So you got to ask sometime for what you need, and you'd be surprised the people who will help you in it. But you got to be committed to standing fast and doing what you're supposed to do whenever you get the work. Mm -hmm. That that is so true, and and what you said about uh, always willing to to do more. I mean, I've been a, a business owner for almost twenty years now, and I still am always trying to learn. Which leads me to, to kind of the last thing because you've got some things coming up. I know I want to. Um, I'm going to be attending some because you can always learn more. Um, but you, you know, we and you talked about the PPP. You know, one of the things that I know you and I've talked about this, but I've heard a lot of other folks say is, you know, that several of us were, were not 
in a position to take advantage of some of the programs, whether it be the PPP or the idle loan or, or other things, because, you know, we're passionate about our business, but you also have to, to do the business of being in business. And I, I tell people all the time, I went to law school and it taught me the, the, the mechanics of the law, how to read the law, that kind of thing. It didn't teach me how to run a law firm. I needed to do other things like, you know, I've done uh, at Mid Midlands Tech, the fast track program. And, you know, I've, I've taken advantage of some seminars that the city has and other things. And I'm constantly working on understanding the business of running a business. Many of us minority businesses, that's one of the areas where we're not as strong in. And that's what the the Minority Business Development Agency does. And, and you've been doing so. Two things and, and we'll close out is. Can you talk about kind of some of the needs as you've been working with small businesses? Where are some of the areas that you feel like minority businesses, we are not performing or not doing at the level we need to in order to, to grow and be profitable and to position ourselves for, for this new era? And then to finish up with what are the services, what are the seminars that you are offering that people need to know about and take advantage of so that, that they can position their business uh, to be successful? You know, when I think about what are some of the things all of us need to do, it is identify new opportunities, see what you can pivot into, see what you can slide into, see what you can get in back into. But when you get into it, you need to have the skill set to do it or the staff with the skill set so that the job you do will no longer be minority. It'll be a quality job by anybody's standards. Then, when I are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. okay. Then one of the things um, when we look at what are we about to do, some of the things that just broke my heart when we started doing the PPP was that many businesses didn't understand their legal structure. So on August 12th, we're having Ernest Cremati the third do a legal structure webinar. And we're using Harold um, from Charleston to do a tax something at the same time. Because depending on what legal structure you choose, says what kind of tax requirement and all you have. And I want to make certain that all of the businesses understand this. Then, another, then one month later, we're going to do something on COVID. I'm beginning to hear from many of our businesses who are afraid that if they go back to their office and somebody will get um, sick or anything, how do they clean it? What's their responsibility? How do they take care of their people? So we're going to the governor and they come back in September. We have several senators, Republican and Democrat, and representative who said, give us your package that you're asking for. And we certainly aren't going to leave the media out and that media is print media and um, publications. We are not going to need the legal out. When I think of the DOT and the right of way that they constantly buy, that to me is a wide open opportunity if they would open their eyes and see that our minority legal can do right away also. And so every area, but that's why we're doing the training in this, then we're going to do one on bookkeeping. Now, that's pretty mediocre, and it might be very small scale. But when we leave it, I want to make certain that they understand debit and credit. They understand liability. They understand cash flow. That they understand bank reconciliation. You know, I didn't always understand it. I had someone who worked for me, Sophia Vickers. She mandated me to learn it. And so because of that, I have such a better understanding now. And I have a good person who's working with me to teach me even more. So it's okay that we don't know it, but it's not okay that you don't hire the people you need. I'm always telling businesses, you need an attorney. You need your risk manager insurance and you need an accountant and all. And if you get those three resources wrapped around your business, then you go do the business of the business and pay those three to do what they do, you'll end up making and growing far more 
if you leave out those components. Because if you leave it out, you will get tripped sooner or later. I'm telling, I tell people all the time, do not use IRS money. They are not a good person to borrow from. They don't <laughs> like you. You must pay them. And when you don't, they go and take their money out of your account. So if you live by that principle, and I've lived by that the entire time I've been in business, because I have watched too many people business go under because they forgot that IRS wasn't their friend, that IRS was someone they must pay. So if there's anything I could leave the group with, particularly the minority businesses, let us commit to being good businesses and then let us bind together to push the market to acknowledge that we exist. And then we can call on all of the corporations, the city, the county, the state, watch us, see us, use us, allow us to do business with you, and we will grow this community. That's excellent. And I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, this is where we need to be. Um, so with that said, oh, I got a couple comments. Uh, Deborah Grant James says, Diane Sumter, a wonderful resource and one of my mentors. Um, so thank you so much for, uh, for listening in, Deborah. So Diane, tell people again, uh, uh, where can they find, and I'll, I'm a share, I've shared the, the, the business structures, um, uh, flyer on my page. So those of you can go to my page. I have it there, but where can people find out? Cause you've got these two coming up, but I know you're always doing things. How can people get in touch with you and how can they find out more about the seminars? Well, for the seminars, you know, and the city of Columbia have joined us on the first one and they are one of the sponsors too. So, and the second one. So we're about to really send those out and we should have it on our web page our CARES web page very soon. And if that falls through, I would tell you to call Tijuana or Camille, but I'll tell you to call me so that they'll still be working for me in the morning. And I'll, <laughs> and I'll be more than happy to get you information and point you in the right direction. And you probably don't know this, but Benedict is opening up his Women Business Center. Cheryl Sally, who's a dynamic manager, is going to be managing that facility. So that's going to be additional opportunities for you. So there's quite a bit of resources out here. What we need the businesses to do, I tell them, try Piggly Wiggly, try Food Lion, try Kroger's, try all of them. And, the, and you'll find each one of them will give you something different at a different time. But they're all resources for you. So I encourage you to call us at the Minority Business Enterprise Center. We look forward to working with businesses. I can tell you that we grew up about 10 years ago and our market is businesses a million and over. But when we moved to that market, we knew that the SBDCs was out here. We know the city's program is out here, the county program is out here and the state, but we will find the right place for you if you would call us. And we welcome you to register for all of our upcoming um, webinars. We're having them one a month through December and everyone is designed to train and you walk away with additional knowledge. Awesome. Awesome. So a couple more comments. Shandell Simmons said, I'm glad I was able to be a part of this conversation. It's needed. You both have given us great tools as going forward. Great. I'm glad you listened in, Shandell. And then shout out for my classmate and your daughter, Dion Fleischman says, well done, a lot of great information. So thanks for listening, Dion. Um, so with that, um, Diane, I just want to thank you so much. Like I said, uh, people think I'm busy. <laughs> you are super busy. I'll, I'll text Diane or she'll text me at seven, eight, six, seven, eight in the morning thinking, oh, it's too early and we're both up. So Diane is up early, up late. And, um, and I, I'm so glad that you were able to take some time out to give us some information. Um, and I thank you number one for, for just being, um, the woman that God has made you to, 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 to be selfless in fighting for businesses. You are always nonstop, relentless, um, even, you know, a thorn in, in people like me sad sometimes, but a necessary thorn. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for sharing your wisdom. And 
most importantly, I mean, I, I think if anybody can definitely hear something from what Diane said today, by believing in this next generation and, and believing that it's time to to build up people so that the, the, the baton can be passed. I'm going to tell you, you got some big shoes to fill. So all those folks who are working in minority business development um, got to step up if, if you planning on passing that baton. But you know, but I love the fact that you are looking at how do we and we keep moving and 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 part wisdom among the young people because this is this is a, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And you know, we might be at a really great time in our country's history, but like it was when Maynard was mayor, it was a great time in the history for him to say, "This is what you have," and it opened up opportunities. But those opportunities aren't a one and done. We got to keep fighting for those opportunities to be open to all of us. So thank you for your fight, Diane. And thank you for um, your information. Um, and I appreciate you so much. Well, and I'd like to thank you and give you a shout out for your leadership and this wonderful city manager. And you all looked up when you hired Melissa Lindler. She has a passion and a commitment. And I'm so pleased to be able to work with all of you. Well, thank you so much. Um, and so for those of you guys who are listening, if you're listening to the replay, um, please go ahead and put hashtag replay and give me a question if you haven't. And I'll make sure that if I can't answer it, I'll get it to Diane and she answers. But please look out for the information. I will post the flyers as they come up. Diane will send them to me and I'll post them. Please, please, please take advantage of these resources at the Minority Business Development Agency. Um, and the other ones that she's given you, because we've got to, as business owners, we got to show up and do the work, as Diane said, but we also have to arm ourselves with education so that we can be competitive. Um, so anyway, until next time, next week, guys, I am going to talk about education, which is really, really important. So I'm going to have a whole week to talk about, you know, going back to school virtually and what does that mean and social emotional learning and all that stuff. So um, stay tuned to my page to hear um, the guests I'll have next week and the topics that we'll be discussing, but um, share this information so that more people can get this knowledge is power. And as always, I challenge you take one, two, three things that Diana said today and put it on your action item list whether it is advocating for more minority businesses, whether it's supporting a minority business, partnering with a minority business, educating yourself as a minority business, whatever it is, please find an action item as to what we talked about today and then take that and move forward. Um, so until next week, I am Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine. Thank you so much for listening and being part of our show. And uh, good night, God bless, and take care. <music>